Brad White Sands, every V2 fired, even for scientific research, was referred to as a round. For the US Army, like the German Wehrmacht, the ballistic missile was a natural extension of artillery. But the Navy and Air Force were concerned about payload and accuracy. The primitive guidance and one-ton warhead of the V-2 rocket were unimpressive from a military standpoint, especially considering that available atomic bombs weighed nearly five tons. The Air Force was the first U.S. military service to consider the feasibility of intercontinental missiles, which meant reaching targets 5,000 miles away. A staggering requirement when considering the 200-mile range of the V-1s and V-2s. Convair Corporation of Southern California was selected in 1946 to develop a ballistic missile test vehicle. It was simply called Project MX-774. A uh, Belgian-born scientist, Carol Bossart, also known as Charlie, was the project engineer. And what he did was he started with the basic V2 configuration and he began to modify it. Uh, he made some very important modifications to the V2. As a structural engineer, Bozart's first concern was trimming the V2's weight. A revolutionary balloon construction replaced the German rocket's heavy, rigid airframe. Using the so-called wet wing design that put aircraft fuel directly into wing compartments, the propellant tanks of the MX-774 became part of the missile's structure. The MX-774 was the first American missile designed with a separable warhead. One of the problems with accuracy was the drag that the missile itself introduced. Uh, so he came up with the notion of having a separating nose cone so you could get rid of the booster and have the nose cone fly onto the target. The power plant was a version of the rocket engine that would propel Chuck Yeager in the Bell X-1 to supersonic speeds. Four of the motors would be used in MX-774, producing a total of 8,000 pounds of thrust. Some within the Air Force scientific community were concerned about the complex problems of operating rockets that were propelled into space. They argued instead for more airplane-like cruise missiles that flew within the Earth's atmosphere. The Air Force canceled MX-774 for budgetary reasons, but Convair was allowed to complete its flight testing. Although all three of these missiles didn't go very far, didn't go very high, and didn't do very much from a scientific point of view, they produced an awful lot of data, primarily in that they validated the concept, they validated the changes that Bosart had applied to these missiles. Convair saw potential in the MX-774 design and continued in-house research. That knowledge would later provide the foundation for America's first operational ICBMs. The military had more immediate issues to contend with. In August 1949, the Soviet Union exploded an atomic device. The United States lost its nuclear monopoly. A menacing atomic shadow ushered in the decade of the 1950s. In the United States, ballistic missiles took a back seat to manned aircraft and cruise missiles as a means of delivering the bomb. Many types of these air-breathing robots were developed, but few were ever deployed. 
Northrop Corporation's snark was fired from a launcher by two solid fuel boosters. These were jettisoned after four seconds, and the missile climbed to cruise altitude, powered by a single jet engine. Long, elegant wings and 26,000 pounds of fuel kept snark aloft for 10 hours. The wings and fuselage separated from the nuclear warhead, which continued onto the target. The system was in development for 10 years. They had this story about snark uh, because of its many failures. They would refer to the waters off the test facility as the snark infested waters because they kept falling into the waters. They had very poor accuracy. The U.S. Navy developed the Regulus as a means of extending its own nuclear strike capability. To launch these, the submarine had to surface, open a hangar, crewmen had to pull the missile out, it slid onto a launcher, you then aligned the launcher, fired the missile. Very awkward system, and also required the submarine to be on the surface. The most influential of the 1950s era cruise missiles was North American Aviation's Navajo, built for the Air Force. Instead of the solid fuel boosters used in other cruise missiles, Navajo used liquid fuel rocket motors, derivatives of the German V2 engine, to reach supersonic speeds and altitudes, where its attached cruise missile would separate and fly to the target. The cancellation of the Navajo project in 1957 marked the end of the intercontinental cruise missile effort. Nevertheless, the program left an important legacy. Navajo was uh, very valuable in terms of uh, all of the technology that it demonstrated, especially the, uh, the North American rocket engines that were used by all of the services in their uh, missile programs. The cruise missile had reached the limits of its capabilities. Arguments against the ballistic missile disappeared. But the United States had to make up for lost time. The age of the ICBM had arrived.